Greetings all. Here I am in Goa, near the beach. Perhaps you can hear the surf a little bit and hopefully not too much. We are coming now to verse 42 in the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra video series. So this is an important verse. This is the end of the section on yogic uh, practices before a section on spacious openness practices or emptiness practices. Now, you might say that, well, it's all yogic practices in this text, isn't it? It's all tantric yoga. But there are certain practices that are more sort of classically tantric yoga in the sense that they're found in multiple texts, multiple scriptures, m many, many different lineages and others that are more specific to this text. Indeed, there's some practices here in uh, the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra that are only found in the, in the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. But this is not one of those. This is, the, again, the last of a kind of little section of um, more or less classical tantric yoga practices. And then we get another section on the same um, after the spaciousness, emptiness practices. So just to give you a sense where we are in the text, I mentioned in a couple videos ago that there's a kind of cross fade where it goes from, you know, transition, transitioning out of sound vibration practice and transitioning into these spaciousness, openness practices. Anyway, here then is the last verse on sacred sound practice, also known as Nada Yoga, and that's verse 42. So, by the way, I just want to mention uh, I wasn't able to schedule this particular live video, so it's just a surprise, <laughs> and um, hopefully the next one or two will be able to um, schedule in advance. It's a little harder in India. Okay, so Here's the Sanskrit of verse 42. Inda mantrasya sarvasya stula varna kramena tu ardendu bindu nadanta shunyo charad bhavechivaha Through internal enunciation of an entire Pinda mantra in accordance with the sequence of its articulable letters, followed by the Ardha Chandra, the half moon, the Bindu, the point, Nada, the resonance, Nadanta, the end of the resonance, and Shunya, the void of spacious openness. One thereby becomes Shiva. So this is a very good example of a practice that cannot be understood without the explanation of a qualified teacher. You can't just read the translation and do the practice. Uh, it's, you know, we could say it's in a, in a kind of code, but it's not really a code. It's just that these terms were well known to people at the time who were initiates, well known to tantric initiates, not to the general public. So, you know, it didn't need a, as much explication in its own time and place. And also there were lots of, um, you know, living masters and gurus and teachers around that you could uh, ask for clarification. So before breaking this down, um, I just want to mention that this is a verse on Uchara, the practice of Uchara, which is elevating a bija mantra through the central channel to the upper limit of the energy body. So you might remember, if you've been watching this in order, that verse 39 is also a verse on uchara, and they're actually very similar, 39 and 42, which are respectively um, yukti number 13 and 16. So what differentiates them? Uh, what differentiates them are the these subtle levels of resonance. Now, I did talk about this some in the last um, 
video on this practice, uh, that is to say in the, in the video on verse 39, when I was talking about Uchada, I did talk about these subtle um, levels of resonance a little bit. And so I was a bit jumping the gun there because in fact, these subtle levels of resonance starting from here and going to here, kind of naming and distinguishing them is the only thing that distinguishes the pr practice in this verse from the practice in verse 39. So both are the practice of Uchada. And in the previous verse, for verse 39, it just talked about the mantra dissolving into the spacious void. But it didn't talk about these levels of subtle um, resonance of the mantra. Okay, so the other thing that d distinguishes this verse is that um, we're, we're told to use a pinda mantra. A pinda mantra is a specific kind of esoteric tantric bija mantra that is impossible to pronounce or articulate um, with the vocal, with the actual mouth, you know. So a pinda mantra, well, I can't really give you examples because these are much more closely guarded, much more secret mantras than other kinds of tantric mantras. So I debated about, mm, should I just share a Pinda mantra with you guys? But there's many, 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 many people in this group now, 4,400 we just hit, and we, and we, we really don't, I don't know them all. <laughs> and everyone's welcome in the group. But really, these kind of mantras called Pinda mantras should only be given in, in um, when there's a little bit of a relationship happening. Now, having said that, I, you know, I could argue that the commentator supports this um, position I just stated, because the commentator, the Sanskrit commentator Shivopadhyaya, writing in the 17th century, he does not, he, he hints at a specific Pinda mantra, the Navatma mantra, uh, but he doesn't give it in the commentary. Instead, he gives Om, or rather Aum, right? So, Aum is not a Pinda mantra, but clearly he's not comfortable giving, um, you know, because often in, in the original scriptures, these Pinda mantras would be given in a special code and you had to know how to decode them, right? So even in writing a Sanskrit commentary, he's hesitant to give it. He, he, he demonstrates he knows what a Pinda mantra is by alluding to uh, the Navatma mantra, but he doesn't give it. Anyway, this is all very, very uh, esoteric <laughs> stuff. Um, if we eventually categorize these videos in terms of like entry level, beginner, intermediate, advanced, this will not be one <laughs> in the beginner category. Um, but right now, we're just going through the Vigyana Bhairava Tantra in the order of the verses, regardless of how esoteric the practices are. Okay, so uh, those of you... Well, yeah, when we get to the point of putting up a Tantric Yoga Now website with a comprehensive curriculum, we could talk more about these um, subjects in the appropriate venues and contexts. Okay, so what's the actual practice here? Well, if you know, uh, but for the very small percentage of you who know a Pinda mantra, um, you know, one of these mantras where it's a bunch of consonants before the vowel comes, not pronounceable, but it is installable, meaning you do a nyasa with it, you, uh, or install and activate the letters of the mantra at different points along the central channel, okay? With the vowel part always coming in the head and the other parts coming uh, before that. So, uh, our commentator says, ah, oh, you know, just use Aum, that's fine. So Aum is a form of Om that's used only when you're doing Uchara practice, not when you're doing any other practice. So it's legitimate to say Aum when you're doing Uchara, um, which most simply defined is giving a whole exhale to each enunciation of the mantra and raising it through the central channel, dissolving into infinite space at the upper limit of the energy body. So the verse, 
go back to the verse. Uh, it talks about these subtle levels of resonance. So what's it talking about there? It's, it talks about um, the Bindu and the Ardha Chandra. Now, or the Ardha Chandra and then the Bindu. So it can, they can come in, in either order depending on what version you're following. Point here is um, you've all seen what Om looks like, the, the Sanskrit symbol of Om. Do you, see, you remember how there's a little crescent moon in the symbol? Maybe you didn't think of it as a crescent moon, but it is one. And then there's a little dot. So in almost every version of Om, because the famous version of Om is not the only one, in my book, Recognition Sutras, you see a Sharada version of Om, meaning the way Om was written in Kashmir, in the script they used there called Sharada. And there it's a dot with a crescent moon on top. And in the popular version of Om, which comes from Devanagari script, it's a crescent moon with a dot on top. Uh, or, so, that, so these are actually reflecting I mean, nobody knows this today, but these are actually reflecting um, slightly different versions of doing uchara. Is it Bindu first or Ardha Chandra first? So uh, the commentator actually inverts the order that we have in the verse, because the verse gives us Ardha Chandra then Bindu. The commentator seems to think, oh, this order is just probably metra causa, meaning it's that in that order just for the to fit the meter of the verse the real order is the commentator thinks uh, Bindu then are the Chandra which is the way it's done in Sharada script in Kashmir okay so I understand that a lot of this is making no sense to a lot of you that's okay we just got to document <laughs> yeah, that's my goal with the series for each verse we're going to document what's going on in this verse some are going to be crystal clear like the next one good news the next one will be crystal clear for you and some are going to be like what is going on because you don't have the background yet anyway point is in the verse we get Ardha Chandra the crescent moon then Bindu and the commentator says no no it's it's really Bindu then Ardha Chandra which reflects again these different scripts whether we're talking about the uh, Devanagari or Shara, the way of writing Om. I just got a tattoo of the Sharada way recently. Oh yes, I can get my shirt up and up. This is silly, right? This has never happened on any of the videos. But anyway, there's the there's the Sharada Om. And you can see you got the Bindu and then the Ardha Chandra, which is the reverse of the uh, Devanagari way of writing it. Um, so Om is written at least 12 different ways in each region of India, but unfortunately there's a kind of um, hegemony of the Hindi-speaking culture in India, and therefore everyone knows that version of Om. They don't know the other versions of Om, you know? So that one I just showed you is the way Om is written in Kashmir in the far north, and this is the way Om is written in Tamil Nadu in the far south which are two heartlands of Tantra. Um, Kashmir, the, one of the original heartlands of left-handed Tantra. Tamil Nadu, one of the original heartlands of right-handed Tantra. More terms that some of you don't know, but some of you do. Forging ahead. Um, so what's the actual practice? Let's get to the actual practice of the verse. Well, here the question is also, do we, do we assume that the verse uh, is alluding to other subtle levels of resonance of the mantra, or does it just want to use these? Because well, here we got, in the verse we got mantra, um, Ardha Chandra, Bindu, Nada, resonance, Nadanta, end of resonance, and then void. We have five levels of, of subtle sound of the mantra from here to here five levels but the commentator says oh yeah there's not five levels there's um what is it eight or nine one two three four five six seven eight nine so the commentator saying no there's nine that's the classical number and sort of the primary sources for tantric yoga nine subtle levels the verse gives five 
I argue it doesn't really matter because it takes years of practice before you can actually distinguish all of these subtle levels of resonance experientially. So for you guys who are doing this practice, almost all of you, it just doesn't matter whether you're considering this as being analyzable into five levels of subtle resonance or nine levels of subtle resonance. Not gonna matter. Some birds in the background. They're doing their mantra practice, so that's a signal <laughs> that we should do our mantra practice, right? Okay, so let's break it down very simply. If we do it with Aum, again, even though Aum is not a Pinda mantra, still, uh, in this venue, in this context, we, we can't really give out Pinda mantras, um, you know, without having established a relationship. I, I, I know, I'm gonna say like over a thousand of you in the group, but not 4,400. Um, anyway, so it, with, again, the, this special form of Om in Uchada practices, Aum, the ah uh sound of Aum starts in the navel, the U in the heart, the um, nasal sound is a cross fade from here to here. You'll hear what I mean in a moment, right? And then there's this focusing of the nasal sound right here at the third eye. Not coincidentally, the third eye is also the upper limit of the sinus cavity. So your sinuses reach up to here. And that's why you can feel a nasal resonance here in the third eye, literally. So that's this focal point of the nasalized resonance of the mantra is this uh, brumadya or third eye point between the eyebrows, okay? And then that resonance gets more subtle and starts fading out just above that Arda Chandra, the, the crescent moon. Then there's a point beyond which you can't feel or hear any sound. That's, that's uh, in the in the full version of the of the practice where it breaks down into nine levels that's called neurodhani the impeder um, because you, it's very hard to feel any sound vibration beyond this point um, to sort of palpably feel it neurodhani or nirodhika interestingly this was one of the contenders um, for uh, you know at the very beginning of the text when Bhairavi is asking Bhairava, hey, what's the ultimate nature of reality? I don't know if you remember, but she says, is it, you know, Bindu, Ardachandra, Nirodhika, or Nada? She's using these exact categories. And it's kind of ironic that we come to this practice now in this verse, because earlier, way earlier in the text, remember, Bhairava had said, no, 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 the ultimate is none of those categories you mentioned. And then those very categories resurface here in a practice verse, which, you know, if we assume coherence in the text must be taken to mean that things that are not, uh, not things, um, experiential qualia, experiences that are not ultimate are still important on the spiritual path, right? Because he already said, this is not the ultimate. This is not the ultimate nature of Bhairava and almost like he was dismissing it, but then here is the very thing he supposedly dismissed, or the very practice and experiences he supposedly dismissed are recurring in the text, showing us that though non-ultimate, they are very significant as part of the practice, okay? So uh, in the comments, I'll give a reference to what I'm talking about after, after the video. So, um, the impeder, the so-called impeder, nirodhini, nirodhika, and then nada, the nada stage, um, resonance, just means resonance, kind of a vague term. Then nadanta, which is the um, end of the resonance, that's just under the skin, it's like basically at the bone level of the crown of the head. And then we have the level of shakti, that's on the surface of the crown of the head, on the skin as it were. And then we have Vyapani. So if you have enough hair to make a top knot, you're supposed to do a top knot for this practice, as I mentioned in a previous uh, video. Vyapani is at the root of the top knot. 
Samana is in the middle of the top knot. Unmana is at the end of the top knot. Okay, that's, those are all the subtle levels of resonance. Now again, the verse only gives five, not nine. So the verse mentions, you know, are the Chandra in Bindu, or perhaps Bindu then are the Chandra. Then Nada, Nadanta, Nad, sorry, Nadanta at the crown, and then void above. Okay, so one of two possibilities. Either the text is just not that concerned with these tiny, tiny, tiny differences, like the level under the skin at the crown and the level at the skin of the crown. That's like a just a half a mil, you know, a millimeter difference spatially. Perhaps the text is not concerned with that level of detail, um, and perhaps it just assumes that you can slot in the ones it doesn't mention. We don't know. Okay. Um, so if you watched the video for verse 39, it's essentially the same exact practice. Um, the, the only difference is that now you're tuning into, much more carefully tuning into these subtle levels of resonance in the Uchada. And if you know a Pinda Mantra, you can use a Pinda Mantra as well. So, such as the um, Samhara Bija, the Bija of dissolution or retraction associated with Kali. That, that one, if you know the one I'm talking about, is a good example of a Pinda Mantra. And then the mantra associated with Matra Sadbhava. It's another good example of a Pinda mantra, as well as Navatma. Okay. Let's just do some let's do some alms. <laughs> so very simple. You're gonna breathe into your belly, into the low belly actually. You're gonna breathe into the low belly, the energy center, which is between uh, Swadhisthana Chakra and Manipura Chakra. It's the secret place, the Buddhists call it, um, or simply the bulb. The Shaivas call it the bulb. It's like the root of the lotus of the heart, like a tulip bulb, but it's a lotus bulb. That's in the low belly. You're going to breathe into that low belly area, and then you're going to initiate the rise of the mantra from there inside the body through the central channel with ah at the level of the navel, ooh at the heart, and then the nasal sounds. So just watch, don't close your eyes yet. Don't follow along yet, just watch as I demonstrate. Again, I did this before, but let's do it again. Hopefully you could hear that there's this nasal quality, right? The mantra never becomes an M. It doesn't end at the lips, the nasal quality, and then it fades out. It focuses here first, and then it fades out. But the point here is, you guys, please try to feel the subtle resonance from here to here. It's inaudible, but it's feelable, <laughs> palpable. So let's do it all together. Breathing in down into the lower belly. So that was a practice one. We'll do it again. Remember to have an exhale pause. Rechaka kumbhaka. 
pause at the end of the exhale. Really empty yourself out, really surrender. Uddiyana Bandha if you want and really just have a timeless moment of openness and surrender. Don't start the inhale too quickly. Yes, this takes practice. If you're feeling panicky and in the exhale pause, well, then just go ahead and take the inhale because panicky feeling is not what we're going for. We're going for the potential to feel absolute spacious, open presence, silent, still, awareness pregnant with infinite potential. That's what you can taste or sense at the end of the exhale and the exhale pause. And I have a couple of members of Tantric Yoga now here. I won't embarrass them by turning the camera around, but uh, they can chant along. Okay, and the key is, remember the mantra is rising through the central channel, which is in the middle of the body, right? Between the pelvic floor and the crown of the head. So when you inhale, you're gathering prana in the low belly and you're leading it into the central channel and then you're exhaling it up as you sing the mantra. The mantra is the exhale. Relax the jaw. Deep breath in to the lower belly. Deep breath in to the lower belly. Deep breath in. And if I'm going too slow for you, it's fine to do a couple of catch-up breaths in between. But in time with pranayama practice, you can do it this slow with total comfort. With a nice five-second exhale pause, maybe ten. Let's do a couple more. Inhale to the lower belly. Focus the prana in the central channel below the navel. Let the mantra start from the navel.
home. I'll do one more just showing you again where on the body um, because we want you to be crystal clear about that. Well, I can't get all of me in the image at once. But um, so below the navel, by the way, there's a subtle kind of H before the Aum. So this mantra is often written in tantric sources, Haum, even though the H is not audible. It's not really pronounced. It's just a sense of an H between the low belly and the navel. And then A uh starts at the navel, then U uh at the heart, and then the cross-fading nasal sound all the way through here. So this is the important part that I'll um, just track for you. So you might notice that in terms of like the space, spatial dimension, the rise of the mantra slows in this area. That's exactly right. So between the mouth and the third eye, the speed at which the mantra is rising through the central channel slows significantly. Um, so if you're confused, go back to the earlier version of this practice, a simpler version given in verse 39, video already posted. And uh, in just a minute here, I'm going to go ahead and do one more video um, so that we get a nice kind of Shakti Shiva thing. Uh, Uchada is a Shakti practice that dissolves into Shiva in the sense of spacious openness. And so the very next verse of the Vigyana Bhairava gives us a beautiful contemplation of spacious openness. I'm going to do it now because very soon I'll be starting a, another pilgrimage and won't be able to do videos. Thanks for your kind attention and thank you to all the patrons on Patreon that make this free content and all the free content possible. Bye! <laughs> Om.